Hey, hey, veggie lover. Last week of 2022, which means that we are going to play the number one most downloaded episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. And that's episode number 197 with Dr. Kim Williams. So right now you are listening to a replay because we are counting down the top five most downloaded episodes of Veggie Doctor Radio to celebrate five years of Veggie Doctor Radio in the last five weeks of 2022. Episode number 197, Vegans at Risk for Heart Disease with cardiologist Dr. Kim Williams. It originally aired in March 6th of this year, and it has been such a popular episode. Obviously, you guys are all interested in heart health, in taking care of your hearts, and doing what you can to decrease the number one most chronic disease in the United States, the number one killer of Americans. So this is really important information. And Dr. Kim Williams is just brilliant. He has some great information. Also, he walks the talk. He definitely follows his advice. And in this episode, you hear what he does to take care of himself, which I just loved hearing from you. He such a great guy and I know he's just doing such amazing work out there. So this is a fantastic episode and I'm glad that we're ending with this one. The number one most downloaded episode of Veggie Doctor Radio, episode number 197, Vegans at Risk for Heart Disease with cardiologist Dr. Kim Williams. Veggie lovers, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing the love of Veggie Doctor Radio sharing it with your friends and families and for giving us feedback, letting us know what you like, what you want to see more of, things that I could improve on. I do appreciate it. So thank you for reaching out. And to my long-term listeners, thank you for hanging in with us year after year, episode after episode, ups and downs, twists and turns. I appreciate you so much. And for the new listeners, thank you. Thank you for giving Veggie Doctor Radio a try. I know that there's so many different podcasts to listen to, and we just put our heart and soul and blood, sweat, and tears into this podcast. So we really appreciate you giving us a try. I hope that you hang out with us for a while. There's so many great things coming in 2023. I'm going to be doing a fasting series. So for those of you curious about fasting and the health benefits of fasting, definitely keep listening. And then for those of you interested in longevity, one of my other favorite topics, I will be doing a little mini longevity series, highlighting some amazing people that are just great examples of longevity, well-being, and joy into their older age. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Enjoy the last week of 2022. Reflect on your gratitude and all the wonderful things that happened this year. And happy new year as we move into 2023. Have a very fantastic day and enjoy this number one most downloaded episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. Welcome back, veggie lovers, to another episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. Today, I have the Dr. Kim Williams. He is so beloved in the plant-based community. What a lovely human. 
I hope you love him as much as I do. Just a reminder before I tell you more about Dr. Williams that the information on this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not meant to replace careful evaluation and treatment. So if you have concerns about yourself, your child, anybody in your family, please see a medical professional. Dr. Kim Allen Williams is chief of the division of cardiology at Rush University and specializes in cardiology prevention and cardiac imaging. He also serves as associate dean for faculty diversity, equity, and inclusion at Rush University, where he focuses on recruitment and retention of the underrepresented minorities and women. He has served on numerous national committees and boards, including serving as the president of the American College of Cardiology, president of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, and chairman of the board of directors of the Association of Black Cardiology. He is also the founder of the Urban Cardiology Initiative in Detroit, Michigan, to reduce ethnic heart care disparities and continues community-based efforts in Chicago at Rush. A native of Chicago's South Side, Dr. Williams has over 30 years of experience as an educator, researcher, and physician. We had such a fantastic conversation. We talked about his plant-based journey and he told some stories that he says he doesn't tell very often. So it was very interesting to learn that. We talked about why a lot of cardiologists and physicians don't know about the power of plant-based nutrition and how he talks to his patients about changing their diet and adopting this uh, plant-based lifestyle and making healthy habit changes. We talk about whether there's a benefit going from predominantly plant-based to exclusively plant-based. How realistic is it that people can reverse their heart disease? Is that true? Is that exaggerated? Why some people may still have high cholesterol despite eating a whole food plant-based diet and what other things they might be able to do to reduce their cholesterol. And he talks about some special herbs, spices, uh, flowers, different things that people can take to reduce their cholesterol. We talk about oil, we talk about saturated fat, and we talk about screening, which is, uh, I think is particularly impactful in this episode. And he also talks about his personal diet and what he does to uh, ensure um, his health in what he chooses um, to eat on a daily basis. So fantastic episode. Thank you so much for coming on board. If you are new to Veggie Doctor Radio, thank you. Welcome. I hope you love this episode. And without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Kim Williams. Dr. Kim Williams, what a great honor. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Like I said, this is a huge honor and you're like an icon in the plant-based community. I have so much respect for you and what you do. And I know that we're gonna learn so much from our time together, but I wanna start at the beginning because you have a great story. Tell us about how you discovered plant-based nutrition and how did you feel when you learned about it? So that's actually a complicated story that I probably haven't told too many times. I mean, the, many people have heard, oh, Williams was a cardiologist who went to a meeting and found his cholesterol was real high and had heard Dean Ornish speak and had seen uh, the portfolio diet come out the same month um, with from David Jenkins, you know, plant sterols, vegan diet, uh, black bean burgers and, and almonds and the like for lowering cholesterol. But it actually goes further back than that. I actually um, uh, was came home from school one day, and my mom, who had quit her job and gone back to college, came home from her, uh, from her Chicago City College and said she had a bio- biology teacher, and this is like late 60s, okay, who actually said uh, to, to the entire class, you should never eat any animals that puts cholesterol in your arteries and uh, people die of heart disease. So she came home and announced that we were bed- vegetarians. Now, uh, obviously, that was not a whole food plant-based diet back then. We didn't know any better. And so there was dairy uh, and even some eggs back then. But uh, I got to see the power of it by having a, a vegetarian household from age about 11 until I went to college, became a tennis player at University of Chicago. And everything was going pretty well, made the varsity team, was still playing number six singles. And then one day, we had one of those dual meets and any you know varsity tennis player knows what that's like where you play singles and doubles and then you take a tiny little break and then you do it again and it turns out that I was on a long mat two two long matches uh, and the 
team forgot that I was the vegetarian. And I had two choices before I played that next match, which was to eat nothing or to eat the Big Mac that they got me. And if you're not used to eating red meat and it had been you know, a good six years or five years, uh, it's not advisable. Um, so I, I learned as a late teenager, so anyway, for all, in the sec for, for all in the first set, after eating that, I was in the corner, you know what, and uh, it was uh, a good object lesson uh, that if you're not used to eating things that are not good for you, I mean, you can develop some tolerance, and that's how you bring babies along, and you inch them along for things that they probably shouldn't be eating, and they develop the ability to, uh, to digest it, but it's not, never was good. Well, it turns out that uh, when you go away from it and you try it again, you're not going to feel too good. And I, I've, I've certainly seen that with patients. Uh, it's one of the things that keep people on a whole food plant-based diet. It's everything from energy levels to GI disturbances. Uh, and I, I, got that, I got to know that up close and personal. Uh, time went on, and uh, <coughs> I um, used a, uh, it was really more of a family <laughs> negotiation that led to eating an American Heart Association diet. Um, from the time I was about 26 to um, really late, almost 20 years of eating chicken and fish. And I, I do feel bad and repent for all those lives who were lost. I, I tease my patients that when you're eating fish and you're eating chicken, the mortality is 100% mm -hmm. for the chicken and the fish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> they chuckle a little bit, but you know, uh, the fact is that it wasn't good for me and, and uh, it wasn't uh, um, good for someone who genetically is predisposed to have a higher cholesterol. And so uh, when I stopped uh, in 2003, my cholesterol went down uh, tremendously on a, a whole food plant-based diet and then became sort of an advocate for that and studied it more and more. Uh, and now here we are, um, that you'd actually be interested in talking to me. So it's fascinating. Wow, what a story. I just want to go back and point out, because I, I always find this fascinating, that you were playing tennis. It's this athletic pursuit. You're trying to be your best self and compete. And then they bring you Big Macs. You know, I just feel like that happens so much in sports events where you're doing your best to train and get faster and get better. But then some people aren't paying attention to what they're putting in their bodies. So I mean, that was really interesting that that's the food that they had provided for their players was Big Macs. <laughs> Yeah, and you know this this is still going on. Um, it's an issue of schools. It's an issue of hospitals, mm -hmm. and we now have a AMA policy against serving people uh, that kind of food in the hospitals. But the hospitals are up against uh, budgetary constraints, and in in this particular world, where many fast foods are actually supported by billions of dollars of government subsidies. It turns out that it's actually very difficult to uh, get the hospitals to change because it's going to increase their pricing, uh, you know, 10, 20 percent, and they have a fixed budget. Uh, so they end up feeding people things that they probably know are not good for them, and the patients know it. And then it puts the doctor in a difficult situation because I have had vegetarians come to uh, a hospital that I was working at and uh, come back to a clinic not being a vegetarian. I said, what happened? He said, well, your hospital fed me X, Y, Z, so I started eating it when I got home. We have to recognize that, that uh, the medical community has an incredibly large influence on um, yeah, that plus marketing, television, advertisement, marketing, and the medical community essentially control what people eat outside of their culture. Yeah, that is so true. My husband is an internal medicine hospitalist, and one thing that he sees a lot is Patients, of course, coming in with heart failure and heart problems. And what he often sees is they come in in heart failure and then he goes in to interview them and the hospital has brought them Lay's potato chips. And that's so conflicting. You know, like you're hearing for heart failure, you probably shouldn't be eating excess salt, but here is your bag of chips, <laughs> you know? So that's very confusing to patients too, because obviously they trust the providers, they trust the hospital to be doing what they think is best for their health, but then they're getting this food that's not coinciding with some of the advice they might be getting. So, you know, that can be a tough situation for patients. 
Absolutely, and and I now that is why we're trying to get some legislation to match the American Medical Association policy uh, uh, for healthy food in hospitals. Uh, but it's hard. It's it's really swimming upstream. Yeah. No, no yeah. question about it. It's, it it's against the dominant culture. It'll take time for sure. Well, let's talk about something that you've talked about before, which is why are there so many cardiologists that aren't aware about the power of plant-based nutrition and the power of diet, or even there's some that disregard diet altogether. I've seen this happen before, which seems alarming to me, but why, why does that happen? So uh, a lot of it is education and a lot of it's marketing. And so, um, so if let me take them separately. So first of all, the education side, we actually published from the American College of Cardiology Nutrition Workgroup a paper a few years ago that did a survey. We have such, in the American College of Cardiology, we have something called CardioServe uh, for doing surveys. You can just take people who sign up to be a guinea pig, sort of think of, <clears throat> you ask me a question and I'm going to answer it. And so we got a good traction on the survey, and it asks you know, about nutrition education in their medical career, not just medical school, but thereafter. And the startling, unfortunate uh, truth was that about 1% of our cardiology practicing physicians felt like they had had enough nutrition training to counsel their patients properly, and 0% of our trainees said that they did. And so this is a major issue. And whenever there have been, you know, uh, for example, I think in Southern California was one of the places where they were going to try to make condition of licensing uh, just a, a few hours of nutrition training. There was pushback from the physicians because they're a they're too busy, and b <clears throat> they're really not that interested. In what what makes so why why are they interested in statins, for example? Uh, why do, why do they follow the guidelines? Well, it has to do a lot with marketing. And the fact of the matter is, the the uh, if you're if you're a major pharmaceutical company and you have a drug that decreases heart attack, stroke, and death by 26 percent in a high risk population, you're going to market that. You're going to sell it. You're going to make you know after it go. I'm not going to use the name of it, but everybody knows probably which one I'm talking about. Uh, a statin that's been around for a long time, famous name, made two billion dollars uh, in before the pandemic uh, annually even though it's been generic for over 10 years. How does, how does that even happen? Because uh, physicians are specifically prescribing it. It's in our guidelines. And now our guidelines say that people should be eating more plant-based nutrition, lowering sodium, decreasing uh, sugar sweetened beverages, saturated fat, and cholesterol. But it's largely ignored. And, and that is because we don't have the marketing anything you know, uh, uh, behind it to get it in front of the face of the physician and constantly bombard them of things that are going to make their patients better. Did I say patients? I, you know, the leading cause of death of doctors and cardiologists is still heart disease. And so it's not just patients. I mean, we are human as well. And if we don't take uh, our foibles and, and our, uh, our uh, vulnerabilities into account for our, and, and govern our lifestyle, with that in mind, then we're going to fall victim as well. And it's, it's really difficult to see uh, my colleagues uh, my age <clears throat> who I, I served in leadership when I was ACC president. I met with them because they were president of their society. And uh, they actually were laughing at my vegan diet, and we have a good discussion about it. You know, um, and I'm never the food police, but you know, I, I'll t if they ask me about it, I'll tell them. And then a few years later, they're dying of heart attacks. and you know, and um, it, it's very hard to feel like you've done a good job by your friends and your acquaintances, um, but you, all you can do is uh, put the data out there, and uh, it, it would be nice if there was a, a more fertile ground. Why are physicians so important? Because they're seeing all the patients, and the patients have families, and the families make up a community, and a community makes up uh, the budget for Medicare, for, uh, particularly in cardiology where it's an older population, for the entire country. And so people don't understand that, um, you know, that Medicare is scheduled to go broke. It was 2026, and then with COVID, it's 2024. And what does that even look like? 30% decrease in, in hospital and physician reimbursement, all because we can't control our lifestyles? Really? Oh, that's sobering. That is very sobering. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Um, Heart disease is the leading cause of death of all Americans, including 
physicians. And so it is important for those of us that are in this space to educate and to bring that message because whatever it, we see over and over and over again, that becomes part of our consciousness. So whenever we're just seeing the advertisements, the drug reps coming in talking about medicines, that's gonna be what's in our consciousness. When you don't hear about these other alternative methods, and I hate to even say alternative, but other ways that we can help patients get better, then you just, you don't practice it. That's not what you know. And I feel like that's where a lot of physicians get stuck is they, they just, are stuck in their bubble of doing things the way that they were trained and not really learning about these other ways to help patients. And, and I'm so glad you're talking about that. Um, and yes, we should talk about alternative uh, and you know alternative medicine versus Western medicine, allopathic. What does it mean alternative? That means that they never did randomized prospective trials to the level that were good enough to get FDA approval of whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so it's seen as alternative because there may be there's some data, maybe there isn't. Well, nutrition is in, in a way in that area that we have some randomized trials that are not large enough. Uh, we have some huge observational trials that really uh, are, I think, prescriptive, not just descriptive. But the problem is that the guideline committees are f really focusing on randomized trials. And having been a guideline writer three times, it's, it's hard to be in that room and bring a bunch of 30-year outcomes because uh, the first thing they'll say is, oh, vegan diet decreases mortality by 10%? Oh, how come that isn't a healthy user bias? That is, people who do a vegan diet make a lot of other healthy choices. They have nothing to do with the food. And you know what? I can't argue against that. It's probably true. I wear my seatbelt. Uh, when somebody's smoking and I see them, I hold my breath. I, I, there's, there's all kinds of behaviors. Uh, e exercise, there are all kinds of behaviors that may make me live 10 years longer than I would have otherwise uh, and may not have to do with just the diet. And that's why we need more large-scale prospective randomized trials. Uh, and until we get them, we're always going to be a little bit behind the eight ball in making yeah. recommendations. Yeah. Amen to that. Well, how often are your patients interested in trying diet and lifestyle changes to decrease the risk of heart disease or decrease their dependence on medications? Do you feel like that's becoming more common that people are asking, doctor, I don't want to be on these meds the rest of my life, or how can I take less meds? What, what else can I do? So a couple comments on it, if I could bifurcate it for a second. Yeah. So first of all, I do see a lot of people for prevention. And, um, but the prevention is in two different varieties, primary and secondary. And that for the lay audience, that means nothing's happened to you yet or you're coming to me after something bad happened, okay? And they are very different conversations. When it's primary prevention, we're doing risk assessment uh, and managing risk factors. And yes, those, those are huge opportunities to not have to be on medications for the rest of your life unless you've got a bad genetic, bad genes, or bad or high-risk disease. And then what I, if I could get the... Uh, I've talked about the allopathic side, not understanding diet, and I need to have our plant-based nutrition realize the power of medications. And we put them together, and I still haven't had a bad outcome in a patient who is vegan on a high-dose statin uh, when it was indicated. And so, you know, I'm sure it'll happen at some point, but maybe I'm not so sure because the LDL cholesterol gets so down when that happens. So, um, so for primary prevention, you have to, uh, they're, if they're in your office, they're motivated because they know they have some kind of risk. It's a totally different conversation when it's secondary prevention. And the classic, of course, would be somebody who has a heart attack, goes to the emergency room, ends up in the cath lab, gets a stent, uh, their enzymes go up, their enzymes come down. I come and see them in the coronary care unit the next morning, and I start a conversation. And it's a very real conversation. I, uh, I ask them for permission to actually s s talk about what may sound like the silliest conversation they ever had with a doctor, but I want to just get to the basics, and they usually say, okay. And I say, all right. So tell me what's your understanding of why you ended up in this coronary care unit. And they said, I had a heart attack. With, uh, and how did the heart attack happen? Uh, I had a blocked artery. Uh, that's right. And what was it blocked with? And regardless of education level or health literacy, most patients can tell you it was blocked with plaque. OK, so then what, what's plaque made out of? Uh, cholesterol, a fat? That's right. And where does that cholesterol and fat come from? And 100% of the patients will tell you, I ate it. Oh. So what I've done there, I've gotten them to utter the magic words of connecting their disease with their diet. And then I say, okay, 
All right, so we are going to put you on a vegetarian diet. You have vegetarian options here at this hospital. Just check them off on your, on your menu. Uh, and we're gonna give you some tools to help you do this at home. And if you don't really wanna do the vegetarian diet, you know, then uh, we'll see you again. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, hopefully uh, people will make a, a change. I, you know, that isn't a, going to 100% in one conversation overwhelm decades of habit and families and culture, uh, but at least we get a start. And at least they know that it's something that they have to address. Wow. I love how you do that. That's beautiful. And I love how you ask permission too. I think that's something that we're learning as physicians to use that motivational interviewing approach. Like, can, is it okay that we talk about this? Because if the patient isn't open to it at all, if they're not in that place where they might consider a concept or consider a change in their uh, habits and behaviors, then it's a no-go anyway. So yeah, thank you for, for sharing that with us. That's lovely. So I have some specific questions and some of these were asked by my audience and things that I'm also very curious about myself. So this one, actually my husband, who's the internal medicine hospitalist, wanted me to ask you. So when it comes to adopting a whole food plant-based diet, how much benefit is there from going to predominantly plant-based, maybe 75, 90% to 100% when it comes to heart disease and prevention or primary or secondary prevention? So I think the best answer to that is it depends on what you have going on and, and how far gone you are. And if you have severe coronary artery disease, you really want to combat that with all, uh, with all of your might uh, and all of your habits. And so uh, you really want to get plaque regression going. And if you're one of the people who can do a plant-based diet partially and still get an LDL cholesterol at our our newest target, which is less than 55. Everybody remember that LDL less than 55. Uh, then, then fine. Uh, there are other issues that happen when you eat animals, uh, such as ruining your microbiome that makes you more likely to be diabetic and hypertensive, and uh, and messes with your cholesterol as well. Uh, and, and if it wasn't for Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and your neurologic system, eating animals would be just fine. Uh, but yeah, in that in that con in those conditions. But uh, when you add it all up. Um, people have many, many reasons, health reasons, including COVID-19. I'm sure everybody saw this data. Wait a minute. I'm not, sh I'm, I'm not sure everybody saw this data. That is a publication from British Medical Journal, and there have been a couple other similar publications saying that if you are doing a plant-based diet, the risk of you getting seriously ill from COVID was reduced by 73%. And so why eat animals in the middle of a dual pandemic? You got heart disease been the number one killer of Americans 1918, and you got COVID that tried to take over in 2020. I haven't seen the final stats to know if it really did or not. But either way, we are living in two pandemics, and both of them are worsened by the, the, the microbiome, the bacteria in your GI tract that, hap, that grow when you're trying to digest the carcass of a, dead, of a deceased animal. Mm -hmm. And so a whole food plant-based diet changes your microbiome completely. You don't get cytokine storm. I still, and I love, I, on a big, prod, uh, a big audience like yours, I'm hoping someone can tell me if they know of a vegan, a whole food plant-based vegan who actually died of COVID. I haven't found one yet. Uh, plenty of, we get COVID, might be the da most dangerous people in the world. Vaccinated vegans, you'll never feel it. You can spread it around to everybody. You'll never feel it's it because you're just not going to get sick. Um, and, but, it's, but even reducing serious illness and moderate uh, degrees of illness uh, is really important. So I'm hoping that everyone will, un will understand that uh, we really need to you know, recognize what we're in and, uh, and make the changes to the lifestyle that will make us live longer. I love it. And I know that you're partial to the heart because you're a cardiologist, but thank you for acknowledging the other organ systems. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, it's important because sometimes we do get reductionist in our way of thinking. We think either just heart disease or we, you know, it, for every person, they may be battling an ailment. So they're thinking specifically about that. But you're right in that we need to think about our whole body, our entire well being. What are the other benefits that we can derive from eating in this manner? to decrease our risk specifically of the number one killer, but other things that might affect our health and well-being and joy in life. So thank you so much for, for talking about that. The other topic I want to ask about, which you talked about plaque regression, and I've heard the 
cardiology community and the plant-based community saying different things about this. So how realistic is it for a patient with active heart disease to regain function after transitioning to a whole food plant-based diet? And can heart disease be truly reversed? Can we use that language or is that an exaggeration? So it's interesting uh, that I'm not sure where the controversy comes from. Anybody who is doubtful, uh, they could look up Esselstyn and regression. Just put those two words in their search engine, and they'll see pictures of you know, that Caldwell Esselstyn has published. And it's a handful of pictures, but that's fine. And then you could do the same thing for Dean Ornish and his one-year outcome and his uh, five-year outcome studies. They are small, but they are definitive. Uh, they reach statistical significance. But then if they're still not satisfied about you know, plant-based diet, one with no oil and one with olive oil, well, then you could actually look at, um, at a, uh, a study like the asteroid trial. This is one where historically uh, the two uh, biggest statin producers were going head to head uh, to see which one did a better job of getting rid of plaque. It ended up in a virtual tie, but they definitely showed that the plaque went away. And it was about 50% over a 24-month uh, period. And then uh, the more recent trial <coughs> was the Glagoff trial. Uh, anybody who doubts plaque regression should look at the Glagoff trial, where they went inside the arteries and took ultrasound pictures, uh, like the asteroid trial did, and showed in no uncertain terms that if you take this injectable cholesterol reducing medicine, Evolocumab, you too will get your plaque to go down if you get your LDL cholesterol uh, down below 58. I think that's where we got the 55. 100% of people uh, at below 55 uh, LDL have plaque regression. And it's a, it's a completely linear function. The higher the LDL, the more progression. Uh, about 89 is where the 50-50 mark is. At 55, 100% of people have plaque regression. So I'm not sure how this got became a big deal where people were thinking that it's overestimated. We have regression of other diseases. Um, you're talking about other organs. My favorite other organ is actually the kidney. Why? Because, you know, we kind of live in a, we're not in a, you know, a third world poor country. We actually have access to uh, dialysis and renal rela replacement therapy. So people don't generally, uh, I mean, with few exceptions, people don't generally die of kidney disease. <clears throat> the kidney disease patients die of heart disease mm. because there's about 12 different mechanisms that we've published on where having bad kidneys sets you up biochemically for cardiac disasters uh, and the volume overload and the hypertension, et cetera. Well, it turns out that there's a whole lot of literature in the, in the kidney uh, uh, journals over the last few years saying very definitively that end-stage renal disease is uniquely tied to red meat consumption. Mm -hmm. And that if you're doing plant protein, you will preserve your kidneys and you can actually reverse uh, and, you know, the not quite in stage, but you can keep that stage four from going to stage five. And sometimes that, that stage three will go to stage two. So we're talking about stabilization and reversal of, of kidney disease. That was unheard of years ago, but yet, yet it's another reason that we should be taking uh, plant-based nutrition very seriously if you're serious about the heart. Yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for sharing that information. That's wonderful. Well, there's a lot of people that transition to a plant-based diet specifically because they know that they are at risk for heart disease or they have already had a heart attack. And some of them may become frustrated because they feel like they continue to have high cholesterol even after they adopt a health-promoting whole food plant-based diet and lifestyle. So I have two questions for you. Is there still benefit? I already know what the answer is going to be, by the way. <laughs> is there still benefit for those uh, people to continue to eat a whole food plant-based diet despite it not completely normalizing their cholesterol? And what else can they do to normalize cholesterol numbers? And maybe you can also throw in what are the reasons that some people may continue to have high cholesterol despite adopting a health-promoting whole food plant-based diet? So it's interesting um, that I was the, the snicker that came across my face when you said that is that I had the strangest clinic yesterday. Typically, a person stops eating animals and their LDL cholesterol will go down by 30 to 50 percent. I was one of those 50 percent people. But yesterday, I saw someone who changed to the Esselstyn diet and had an 86 percent decrease in his LDL cholesterol. I had never seen anything like that. And I saw another patient right after him 
who had a rise in her LDL on a plant-based diet. Unbelievable. And so what are, the, what are the factors that make one versus the other? A lot of them actually are foodstuffs. And so uh, with the help of a bunch of my patients, I've actually put together uh, a lot of things. And you could do this with a search engine, uh, but there are a lot of uh, natural compounds that can lower your cholesterol. And some of them were in that, that, um, uh, that initial portfolio diet. Uh, with you using almonds and plant sterols. And, you know, there's commercial pills for plant sterols now. And, uh, and psyllium, everybody knows that. It's like Metamucil and Benefiber, those things are over the counter. Uh, but in addition to those three, there are a bunch of flowers like bergamot and berberine. And uh, um, an another one is called neem. It's a Siamese neem flower. And there are loads and loads of plant things. Some of them are nuts, uh, walnuts, for example. In order to get on my little list, you have to have a, a peer-reviewed publication of a, uh, uh, of a randomized trial. And so we've got about 18 of those things uh, that are out there available that people can add to their diet or add a pill or add, a, add it to their salad um, that will actually lower uh, the cholesterol. Now, the problem I have with it is that you know, when I want to use two drugs for, for lowering cholesterol, I generally have what overlap there's going to be. That is, you know, I put in the statin and azetamibe together, and I have published literature about what that combination is going to do. We don't have that for any of these, you know, when you do Indian gooseberry and onion oil. I don't know what that's going to do. Is it additive? Are they going to detract from each other? But you, since they're all plants, you could just sort of assume that, um, that they're all going to be okay. Uh, some of them don't seem to work very well uh, in my patients, and some of them work really well. And so I, every, every person is a little different. So I, I would encourage anyone who's struggling with that uh, to at least look at some of the alternative. And they are alternative therapies, even though they do have randomized trials. They're not to the point where they are uh, FDA approved. As far as I know, there's only one of those things on that list that actually has outcomes trials, and that's red yeast rice. Why? Because red yeast rice is a fungus making lovastatin. And, you know, I, the company actually tried to sue them to get it off the market because it, it really is lovastatin. Uh, but even though they had a patent at the time for that drug, they were making it in a lab. This thing was being made in a fungus, and it was a nutritional supplement, and so they, I think they lost that lawsuit. Um, so uh, you now have sort of unregulated um, statin out there. And they, they actually did show not only does it lower LDL, but it lowers cardiac events. Why is that not exciting? Uh, because it was kind of our weakest statin. It has sort of less uh, impact than the rest of them. So it's not something that we're really excited about, and you never know how much you're going to get uh, mm -hmm. out of an, a given pill. Uh, so for a population, you'll do well. For an individual, I'm not so sure. Um, so, but let me go back to one thing that, that I don't want to be remiss in saying, that a lot of people will go vegan trying to drop their cholesterol, but not what you said, and that is a whole food plant-based diet. And the difference is that if you're eating uh, stuff with a lot of saturated fat, uh, if you do a lot of refined grains, you're glycating your LDL, making it more dangerous. You're actually increasing your LDL, decreasing HDL when you're, every time you eat sugar, you actually can re be ruining your cholesterol without the use of animals uh, by having stuff. And if you take a plant and you put it in a plant that is a factory and it comes out uh, changed, please read those labels. Find out how much saturated fat, how much, um, unref uh, how much refined grains versus uh, whole grains is in it. And when you're done with that, reject the things that are going to have substantial amount of sodium, saturated fat, and refined grains, sugar versus fiber. Yeah, that's a good point. And I feel like coconut oil, they're putting in everything now. And I'm sensitive to that. I, um, with a plant-based diet, my total cholesterol drops between 100, 115. And I got, I developed this recipe for this um, vegan Greek yogurt that is amazing, but it uses coconut milk and cashews. And I was eating that every morning. And when I got my cholesterol rechecked during one of those phases where I was eating that every morning, it went all the way up to 150. And it was the coconut milk. <laughs> so I was like, yep. man, that stuff's good. <laughs> but So now I just, I just have it every once in a while because, you know, it's still part of my life. I just don't have it every day. But 
We do have to remember that there are saturated fats, but also a lot of processed foods in the plant-based diet, like some of the vegan butters and some of the vegan cheeses have more saturated fat in them. And, you know, sometimes it can become a little bit more of a habit to have those regularly. But for those people that are, because I do get messages from people that that swear that they're eating the whole food plant-based, no oil, all this stuff, and they still have high cholesterol, is it mostly just going to be that they just have a genetic propensity to make more cholesterol themselves? Yep, there is a lot of that out there, no question. Um, and uh, it's been estimated that one in every 250 people has heterozygous familial hyperlipidemia, fa fancy words for a gene that either ruins your ability to take up the cholesterol out of the bloodstream or get rid of it and... Uh, or you're overproducing it. And uh, hopefully we will do a really good job with all of the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations to get all adolescents uh, to have their cholesterol checked. Uh, and then you can reverse identify them, like the UK is doing a great job. They're having a little trouble with Scotland, I hear, but maybe they solved that. Um, that every, every uh, baby or that goes through pediatrics uh, gets their cholesterol tested. And then it's 50-50 for most uh, if you remember all of your um, uh, uh, your genetics, of course, autosomal dy dominant means 50-50. That is, if you have that gene, your half of your siblings have it, more than likely, half of your children, and one half of your parents. Um, and if, yeah, and so uh, hopefully uh, we would start something like that to start with the younger kids uh, because pretty much every kid in the United States gets a well baby visit, not all, but so many, most of them do. And if we have just uh, a way of identifying all those people who have high cholesterol, then you can get all the parents before they actually have an event. And that's the, that's the thing is, that's key because the parents are in their 20s and early 30s and they haven't had um, the, the heterozygous familiar where you have one bad gene, two bad genes, you're getting problems in your 20s and 30s. One bad gene, you're getting it in your 40s and 50s. Wow, interesting. So what you're saying is that they're doing genetic testing on the babies to see if the babies have a risk for hyperlipidemia, or what, what are they testing yeah. in the babies? It's simply high, looking for high cholesterol. And so the high cholesterol, a lot often when we get these ridiculously high levels at times in patients, it's still dietary and lifestyle. But if you get an LDL, the rule of thumb is that if, you're, if you get an LDL of more than 190, there's about a 3% likelihood that that person actually does have uh, instead of the one in 250, it's up to three, three out of 100 that it will actually have heterozygous familial hyperlipidemia. Wow. Yeah, that's so interesting. So I, I'm going to just be honest here, okay? I was not checking my patients for hyperlipidemia regularly just like across the board, everybody. And then in the mm -hmm. past year, I started screening at 11 years old, everybody, um, even if they didn't have family history. And I was shocked actually. <laughs> so and so thank you for reminding us for, for doing that because yeah, like I was really shocked that there were some kids. And then what's funny too, is that you get these good family, what you think are good family histories and you're asking about heart disease and stuff which never came out. And then you get this patient that has this high cholesterol and then they're like, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you. Um, so-and-so <laughs> died at 50 from, I'm like, okay, well now they're going to go see, you know, cardiology and, and be in the lipid clinic. But um, yeah, it's, it's amazing how you'll pick stuff up and you wouldn't know unless you check for it. So thank you right. for that reminder. Absolutely. Okay, um, omega-3 DHA EPA, is that something that you feel that plant-based eaters should supplement with and what are the benefits right now that we're seeing in the literature for cholesterol? So the, the, the primary role of omega-3 fatty acids in cardiology is the treatment of hypertriglyceridemia. The, it's one of our first line eight ways to, to help things. But I have to say, if we're gonna talk about triglycerides, it's you know, three fat, fat molecules put together. <clears throat> we have to talk about lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Are you exercising enough? Are you eating a whole food plant-based diet, avoiding the vegan ice cream and the sugar and all the things that the fat um, refined grains that make uh, the triglycerides go up? and really um, take part in that cycle of diabetes, uh, <clears throat> particularly central obesity and metabolic syndrome. And so uh, what we'd like to see is that uh, people are doing much, uh, uh, they're monitoring it very carefully, and uh, if they still are elevated, 
then, <coughs> excuse me, if they're still elevated, then you could actually use the omega-3 fatty acids that are commercially available. The ones that are um, over the counter uh, may have some problems, such as um, if you're using f real fish to get fish oil, you're going to have some issues with uh, mercury, PCB, saturated fat, you know, and uh, and the like. And so, um, plant-based ones are actually safer for you, uh, which is very helpful. But um, uh, the EPA uh, versus DHA, that's a completely different uh, conversation. Started with the combination of them, uh, FDA approved not just for lipids, but for, to try to lower events, and they really don't lower events very well. The one exception was a product that came out a few years ago uh, that actually uh, isolated the DHA uh, out of the product and only the EPA. And that became controversial in this last year, even though it's been out for a while and it's FDA approved and it got into our guidelines to use it because it decreased uh, cardiac events. It turns out that, <clears throat> that their comparator was a problem. Whereas most of the DHA EPA combination drugs were being compared to corn oil, the EPA alone compared it with mineral oil. Oh. And it's a tiny little thing, except it's a huge thing. The, and so they're being accused of setting up a straw man that they could, you know, that they could win and show a 24% decrease in events when they were actually increasing the events with the mineral oil. Uh, they're arguing strongly against it, <clears throat> but I would say at this point, um, the EPA versus EPA plus DHA is in total disarray, and we would need an, another huge randomized trial uh, because each one of the ones with DHA and EPA, uh, all the observational stuff look great. Uh, it'll stop you from having Alzheimer's disease. It'll stop you from having atrial fibrillation. It'll do all of these wonderful things. And then in randomized trials, large, well-controlled randomized trials, they're essentially worthless. Mm. And so I know that's that is about the commercial stuff, about the pharmaceutical grade stuff. Uh, but your question is, should people who are avoiding fish be supplementing? And the answer is probably. I haven't seen a lot of long-term outcomes with randomized trials, um, but it's certainly safe to take them. Uh, ultimately, you know, fish are not the source of, the people think that the fish oil is the source, but they're actually eating seaweed and kelp. And so we can get them from the seaweed and the kelp. Um, and you can also, with convert biochemical conversion, uh, which is variable from human to human, you can take alpha-linoleic acid and, from walnuts and turn it in, for example, and seeds and turn it into the omega-3. So uh, there are plenty of plant-based uh, uh, ALA and omega-3s that people can use um, while we're still trying to search out that data. In theory, it's probably a good idea to take some. Yeah. Uh, that is for cerebral and uh, cognitive impairment uh, prevention. Yeah. And even people that aren't vegan, uh, you know, some people eat fish and some people don't. But in general, it seems like the omega-3 fatty acid levels can be pretty low, even in omnivores. So it is one of those things that I think we're learning more about and we'll see more research and data about. But for vegans, not to worry, there are vegan sources, this microalgae, this algal oil, um, it still tastes fishy, but that's because it comes you know, from things that come from the ocean. <laughs> so it has right. that algae you know, flavor. But um, once you get past that, especially in capsule form, it's not a big deal. So. Um, okay, so this is a question you probably get a million times, and we've touched on it a little bit, but the the war of oil, okay? So oil, no oil, olive oil's better, it's not good, whatever. So what is your stance on oils? Which ones can be potentially harmful for us? And is olive oil potentially helpful? Should people look at reintegrating it if they have developed a lifestyle where they're off of oil? Um, those are the questions I have about that one. So yeah, it's, you know, going back to the vegan wars from a couple of years ago, where we have highly successful publications and <clears throat> promulgations of, you know, of diets from different vegan centers. And um, they were sort of going to battle over this concept. And uh, <clears throat> the no oil people have some 
good things to say. That is, you know, if the, if you eat fat, you're more than likely going to have difficulty losing weight because mm -hmm. of the ca calories. Um, <clears throat> but the people who are saying that you need some of these <clears throat> for you know, to avoid cognitive impairments, going back to the conversation we had about omega-3s and alpha linoleic acid, uh, which are in a lot of these compounds. Well, but the other thing that I would inject into this is the whole discussion of saturated versus polyunsaturated versus monounsaturated fat. And that if you're looking as a lipidologist, uh, someone who's concerned about cholesterol, the monounsaturated and the polyunsaturated fat actually are beneficial for cholesterol. Now, the one side is going to say that that's just a substitutionary benefit because you're getting rid of saturated fat. There's probably some truth to that. But also, if you look at a neutral population and compare it, you will see a reduction in LDL cholesterol when you add these things. And so <clears throat> I would say that if you're overweight and struggling with weight, this is probably not a place that you want to go. And I actually do use one of those you know, no oil diets in people who are overweight and obese. Um, but you know, in people who are exercising well and going to burn those calories, uh, I try to get them to use the um, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated uh, fats. Uh, and I have to do one shout out here. Uh, on my, I had to add to my list yesterday avocados. Now, why weren't they there in the first place? Well, we have some people saying don't ever eat, ever, don't ever eat them. Um, but I really don't like the taste of avocados. Love guacamole. <laughs> hate avocado. Well, it's just, you know, the, you know, they always felt like there was too much fat in it. So it's interesting uh, that I finally have to cave because there was a huge randomized uh, trial uh, published that uh, showed beyond a reasonable doubt you're going to get about a 15.3 percent or 15.3 points off of your LDL cholesterol if you're using avocados. Woohoo! <laughs> That's exciting news. I, I'm team avocado, okay? And I also for a while was completely excluding like all overt fats, but I reintegrated it and I was able to balance it in a way that works for my body. But avocados aren't as dense as some of the other sources. And I think they're delicious. But I would say if you like guacamole, you have to say you like avocados because guacamole has avocado. So how could you? I don't I don't know how to say that. <laughs> to me, it's the same difference between oatmeal and oatmeal cookies. They're completely different. <laughs> <laughs> You're so funny. All right. Well, that's fine. You, we can still be friends because you like guacamole. So that's fine. We'll just make sure when we have a party, uh, the guacamole will be there so you can have that. But yeah, that's good news. And I'm sure a lot of people will like to hear that as well. Now, when it comes to these monounsaturated, polyunsaturated fats, I mean, couldn't you just eat it from the whole food? Like, can't you just have like your walnuts and your olives instead yes. of having the oil? If I mean, I would prefer to just eat it and chew it rather than putting oil in my food personally. Uh, I agree, but you know, when I'm when I'm doing cooking, you know, adding a little olive oil to you know, make some of my, you know, particularly strange specialties like blackened kale and and uh, that sort of thing, it, it goes a little better with some mm -hmm. olive oil. But mm -hmm. you know, I, I you know, my other disclosure is that you know uh, I do eat a lot of nuts. And nuts, uh, unlike there are some people, and uh, people have written books about this, uh, about uh, gaining weight on nuts. For many people, and the average person, you actually lose weight. And I'm one mm -hmm. of those. Mm -hmm. I will, if nuts will suppress my appetite. I will forget to eat. And next thing you know, I've lost a couple pounds. <laughs> and so um, the, the olive oil, not just lowered my cholesterol, but stopped me from losing so much weight. Wow. That, I mean... I don't, I don't even know what to say to that, but I am, that's great, Dr. Williams. I don't think anything suppresses my appetite. <laughs> so I will just keep eating. I love food though. So not, I, I don't think I've ever in my life forgotten to eat. So that's, uh, that's something that I can't identify with, but I'm glad that you're able to tune into your body and realize that that's happening. All right. Well, so to look at the scale sometimes. <laughs> I, 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 oh, my patients hate hearing this, by the way. Oh, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, you, I mean, you, you know, poor um, baby, you can't gain weight. <laughs> <laughs> You're just in the small minority. But, you know, we do have we will have empathy for you that, you know, that can be an issue. Um, should people that eat a whole food plant based diet still be screened for cardiac disease, for cardiovascular disease? Well, so we actually put 
uh, I, and every, everyone who's listening, I'm hoping that you could grab your, um, your smartphone and download the American College of Cardiology ASCVD risk calculator. That's atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. It's a risk calculator that'll, that'll tell you whether or not you really should be evaluated for, uh, you know, for pr primary prevention of heart disease. Uh, what it'll do is take your um, age, ethnicity, gender, and your recent blood pressure, and your most recent cholesterol, uh, whether or not you're a smoker or diabetic, and um, you, they will put it into the, what's called the pooled cohort equation. And that will, if you get a number that's less than 5%, you probably don't need to do anything different uh, if you're doing a whole food plant-based diet and you're exercising. If you, if you have uh, more than 20%, you need to go in right away and get medication as well as make any other, uh, any additional uh, lifestyle things that you've been lacking or lack of motivation to do. Between 5 and 20, there's a couple of scenarios. One is 5 to 7.5 is one that's considered intermediate risk. It's not high enough to just give you medication uh, in addition to lifestyle, um, but it's high enough to say, you know, we need to ask you some questions. And there's a, a number of those questions. Any evidence of chronic kidney disease, any family history like you were talking about of, uh, uh, in your patients uh, that they hadn't disclosed, any um, of these strange lipids like LP little a, lipoprotein A elevation, uh, an APOB level, a small dense LDL, a high C-reactive pro protein. You're getting the drift. That there's, there's all these little cardiovascular risk factors that we generally ignore, but not if you're 5 to 7.5 percent. If you're 7.5% or above, you probably should be getting onto a medication unless you are, if you're doing everything else right. If you're not, try to do everything you can to get it down below 7.5%. Why is 7.5%? That's the point at which um, any concerns about risk of medication go out the window. You're going to be better off on medication. And so we use that as the cut point. Now, there is one way to get out of it, and that is a coronary calcium score. If you're less than 20%, a coronary calcium score is a very inexpensive way to try and figure out if you have plaque in your coronary arteries. And we do three different things. If your score is zero, you're kind of like cardiovascular immortal for the next year. I'm sorry, the next 10 years. It's not 100% true, but it's, it's pretty close. Uh, that's from the MESA trial. Number two, if you have a, a tiny little plaque up to a mild amount, that is a score of 1 to 100, then you really should be on a medication. Mm. That is, whatever you're doing with your lifestyle, fantastic. Make it better, but com combine it with medication, typically a statin, to get your LDL less than 55. Mm -hmm. If you're more than 100 for a score, then you need the statin and the aspirin and the vegan diet and an exercise program. That, by the way, is my favorite acronym that I do on my patients. I call it SAVE, statin, aspirin, vegan diet, exercise, and so they can all remember that I want to try to save them. And so hopefully uh, <clears throat> people will rec recognize that at a, a score of 100, there's substantial risk of having a bad outcome uh, in the future years. And you need to go everything you can, um, whole hog without the pig, of course, uh, to try and get um, that risk to be mitigated. Oh, that's so comprehensive. Thank you so much. That gives us really practical advice that we can look up and determine where we are, when we need to go in, make sure that we're getting screened, and you know, maybe using some medication to help us decrease our risk for these cardiac events. That was that's really great. I would can love. I oh, go ahead. Yes. About that. About the risk calculator. Yeah. It's great for parties. For parties? Uncle Joe. Yeah, Uncle Joe, what was your cholesterol? What was your last blood pressure? How old are you now? Oh, my goodness, you're 17.5%. you got to see your doctor tomorrow. <laughs> it really does help. I'm it sure, pe I'm sure people I'm sure people love that. <laughs> <laughs> especially, especially as they're dipping into the guacamole with their chips, you know? <laughs> Good point. Okay, that's great. No, that's that's wonderful. And I will. I want to plug my numbers in and see where I am, too. Okay, I'd love to know if you'd like to disclose, if you're comfortable disclosing, what your personal diet is like. What do you like to eat on a regular basis? Now you talked about how nuts are, you know, make you not eat as much, but are there any specific foods that you specifically like to include in your diet on a daily basis? My goodness, um, I'm all over the place. Uh, whole food, plant-based diet, but I do, you know, that whole thing, uh, 
is it a is it you know are you eating something from a plant and then was that plant processed in a plant uh, I do eat processed food if it meets all of my criteria I flip over the label it's got to have hopefully less than 300 milligrams of sodium per serving uh, and, and if I'm going to go above excuse me if I'm going to go above that level then I have to modulate whatever else I eat that day so I'm not going to go over 1800 I know I don't have high blood pressure my blood pressure is vegan low at 104 but I'm still African American male and over 60 so I have to be very careful mm -hmm. uh, with that I look at the saturated fat content and I, you know I, I like to keep it at one a gram of saturated fat and if my vegan cheese has three grams per serving then I kind of want to use a third of a serving so mm -hmm. I don't go over the one and if I do go over the one I'm not I'm certainly gonna try to do something different the next day mm -hmm. um, so I and then the next one is the amount of uh, sugars that is you could take something that's really healthy and somehow modulate it in a plant so that the fiber is not as much as it should be and if that item, whatever it is, has a sugar to fiber ratio of greater than four to one, I'm not going to eat it. And, or I'm not going to eat it like it is. I do like raspberry berry sorbet. Great. I'm going to put nuts and um, goji berries and a whole bunch of fiber in that while I'm eating uh, that sorbet. I'm not going to eat it by itself. Yeah. Wow, that's great. You're so disciplined. I love it. I feel well, like... I mean you could say paranoid. Yeah. <laughs> I'm putting it in a positive light, Dr. Williams. <laughs> but, you know, sodium is hard, especially if you are eating more processed foods. It adds up really, really <coughs> quickly for a lot of people um, in the United States because there's so much sodium in a lot of food. So that's one that you do have to kind of be mindful of, especially if you add more salt to the top of your foods too. Ooh. Yeah, and, and so I actually... Uh, always have a potassium salt shaker, not a sodium one. And uh, <clears throat> that obviously, if you have, you know, end-stage renal disease, that could be dangerous, you know, because the high, high potassium is, you know, uh, can stop your heart. But uh, if you're not in that situation, you really do um, should you add potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride. The taste is similar. Maybe it's a little bitter. To, yeah, but, you know, once you have that paranoia I mentioned, I actually like the taste of potassium more than sodium, so hmm. it makes it a lot easier. I might give that a try, see what that's like. Mm -hmm. What do you wish more people knew? I would say uh, <clears throat> if I had to pick one thing that I would do public service announcements on, it's the microbiome. Uh, <clears throat> people do not realize, A, that they're only 43% human, that most of the cells in their body are not human cells, uh, there are all of these microorganisms going around, either being destructive or helpful. And that when you eat the carcass of the decaying flesh of an animal, you're putting bacteria in and promoting the development of bacteria in your GI tract that are going to create the chronic kidney disease, all of the brain stuff we talked about earlier, heart attack, stroke, death, and all of the risk factors. Mm -hmm. And so please, if everyone just study up on the microbiome, change your diet, uh, live, let live for the animal rights folks among us and live longer. I love it. Thank you so much. How can listeners connect with you and tell us with what, what work you're currently doing? What do you want everybody to know about? Um, so I'm actually chief cardiology at Rush University, <laughs> Rush University in Chicago. I'm also associate dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I uh, focus on prevention and management of coronary heart disease. Um, but, it, you know, plant-based nutrition is a lot bigger than that. You know, 41% decrease in heart failure readmissions and uh, pretty much everything that we do is affected by nutrition. Mm -hmm. And I'm hopefully, to, with help from you, uh, getting the word out to more people, more physicians, more lay people. Um, and I, I would uh, hope that this whole issue of dual pandemic that I mentioned before and COVID mortality all of this could be so much better if people were to do better with their diet and exercise. Yeah, I love it. Are you on any social media, Twitter, anything like that? Um, I do tweet uh, every now and then. It's, uh, uh, I, but I pretty much only tweet randomized trials. <laughs> so it's uh, 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 at cardio tennis, and tennis is spelled one zero s, like tennis. Okay. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, very good. Okay, 
Last question. Leave us with mm -hmm. one tip for busy moms. What is one thing that they can start doing today to decrease the risk of heart disease for themselves and for their families? Wow. So, uh, so to, you'll have to forgive me. My last uh, maternal fetal rotation was 1978, <laughs> but I still remember some of this stuff. Um, <laughs> if I had to pick out one thing from, you know, probably from modern cardiology, is to, to know and follow your blood pressure. Um, because particularly uh, with pregnancy, the rises in blood pressure, particularly in our community, in inner city Chicago, um, not everybody realizes that maternal fetal mortality in the black community is that of third world countries and worse mm -hmm. than most of them. Mm -hmm. And the funny part about that is unlike, you know, hypertension, so many other diseases, it tracks with the ethnicity not with the social climbing. So you will have a PhD or Serena Williams, that's, you know, the tennis star, having difficulty with labor and delivery and illness thereafter and almost dying. And this is something that we have to focus on uh, so much more. Uh, and there are so many, it's so multifactorial, uh, but it starts really with blood pressure and lifestyle. Okay. That's a great tip because especially, you know, I feel like whenever you're a younger person, you may be a young mom, you go to your ob gin while you're pregnant, but then your focus after you have the baby, your focus turns to your child and you may let your health drop off and not see your healthcare provider for a while. So that's a good reminder to make sure you're going in, getting your blood pressure checked and following that as one of your metrics of health. Dr. Kim Williams, I appreciate you so much. Thank you for all your caring, your compassion, your hard work. I just love all the different concepts you taught us, how you approach your patients, and lots of the great tips that you gave us. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your time and everything that you do. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you, and I learned a lot from you too. So thank you so much for the opportunity. And I hope that you have a very plantastic day. Do you love Dr. Williams as much as I do? What an amazing physician, so caring, so compassionate. And wow, he had some great information to share with us. What I love the most is that he talked about the ASCVD risk algorithm. So I went on and I found one at mdcalc.com. I just Googled it. I just Googled ASCVD risk calculator. I put my numbers in and my risk is 0.2% in the next 10 years. So I'm very happy with that. I initially did another one that came up and it wouldn't let me put a total cholesterol less than 130. And even this one flags it because my total cholesterol is 114. It even flagged it and said, very low, double check. It's thinking that it's uh, not true. But I tend to, uh, when I eat a whole food plant-based diet and I'm avoiding those saturated fats like from coconut and those kinds of things, my cholesterol ranges between 100 and 115. And like I was telling Dr. Williams, when I was eating a bunch of coconut milk, like every day I was having that yogurt, which is delicious by the way, um, my, cholesterol, my total cholesterol was getting up to 145, I think, 145, somewhere like that. So. I'm not doing that as often. So definitely look that up if you want to know your risk score. And I think they're using this for people above the age of 40. I'm not sure. It says this calculator only applies to individuals 40 to 75 years of age. That's the one that I'm doing. I'm not a cardiologist, I'm a pediatrician. So this is not something I use on a regular basis. But if you have any further questions about that, please just ask your physician, but you might wanna check that out. I also love how balanced he was and speaking about, you know, oil, whether it's something that you should include and talking about his diet, which I think was super helpful for me. Just a reminder about the sodium because usually I try to keep my sodium low, but lately it's been creeping up and it's one of those things that your taste buds adapt. So if you're using more salt, you're gonna expect more salt. You start decreasing the salt in your diet, then you're, going to do fine with it, you'll adapt to it within a few weeks. So that's a really good reminder as far as the sodium because it does increase our risk, especially people of color. So I am higher risk for hypertension and it runs in my family. So that's something that I want to pay attention to. But overall, excellent episode. I hope you got a lot out of it. Thank you so much for hanging in there and listening. And as always, I hope that you have a very plantastic day. 
Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.